to demonize men, to demonize women, to suggest that they are intrinsically flawed is a satanic project. Is it? Really? I thought that this was the whole narrative of Genesis. We're fallen, cursed by God, because someone else ate a fruit. And we're seeing it happen, obviously we're seeing it happen with men, but we're seeing the same thing happen with really the erasure of women, and ultimately it's an attack on God and God's view of men and women. So, my fellow apes, what on earth is going on here? Well, we've got Nancy Randolph Pearcy and Eric Metaxas ignoring history as they reshape the narrative of masculinity, all while cheering for a return to the good old biblical times. Before we dive into this circus, though, let's introduce the jesters. Nancy Randolph Pearcy is a fellow at the Discovery Institute. Yes, the very same institute known for dressing creationism in a snazzy lab coat in the attempt to get the Bible taught as science in schools. Come on, Doc, it's not science! Nancy was also a contributor to the infamous Off Pandas and People, which featured prominently in the Kitzmiller vs Dover Area School District trial, which resulted in intelligent design being told to intelligently get out of the science class. At a time when this country is lagging behind other nations in scientific literacy, we can ill afford to shackle our children's minds with 15th century pseudoscience. Nancy's recent evangelical offering, however, is her book titled The Toxic War on masculinity, how Christianity reconciles the sexes. As you'll soon come to appreciate, Nancy wrote this with her faith and flair for provocative titles. And as for Eric Metaxas, well, he's a fascinating character. Also quite a hit in evangelical circles, his flock gathers around him to hear stories, literary gems like Donald Builds the Wall, Donald Drains the Swamp, and is atheism dead? I try to um, be respectful of people with, with whom I differ. Now, while Eric claims to be respectful with those he disagrees with, he will, and indeed has, straight up punched in the back of the head those who disagree with him. I try to um, be respectful of people with, with whom I differ. Oh! No, you don't have to go back. What a great example of toxic masculinity, huh? Isn't it nice that Nancy counts Eric as an ally? Anyhow, let's get to it already. Take it away, Eric. A lot of people have this, um, I, I, I think a lot of people don't really understand how this has been worked out in history. You know, what, what, what was a man and a father uh, in the 19th century, for example, and how that led to, the, and you deal with that in the book wonderfully, so why don't we start there? Alrighty, we're starting with a history lesson. Fantastic. I love history. Give it to us, Nancy. A lot of people would say, oh, well, this hostility to masculinity perhaps came out of the 1960s, second wave feminism. Hostility to masculinity? Don't you mean hostility to toxic masculinity? Second wave feminism challenged, and successfully, I'll add, toxic masculinity. You know, since these two intellectual giants won't define toxic masculinity, I'll do it for them. Toxic masculinity refers to the cultural norms and behaviours associated with certain aspects of traditional notions of masculinity that are often harmful to both men and society as a whole. To be clear, those who issue critique of toxic masculinity are not claiming that all traditional masculine traits are bad, they are claiming that some traits are bad. You know the ones. Emotional suppression, men being encouraged to repress their emotions, particularly vulnerability and sadness. Hyperaggression, teaching men to value aggression and violence as a way to solve conflicts and to prove one's manhood. I try to um, be respectful of people with, with whom I differ. Next, we have dominance, the belief that men must always be in control. Dominant in relationships and social situations, and that showing any form of submission or deference is a sign of being totally gay. Hypercompetitiveness, insisting that men must always win and be the best, often at the expense of others. Risk-taking and recklessness, dangerous and unnecessary risks to prove one's masculinity. Then we have sexual conquest and objectification, you know, treating women as objects rather than individuals with autonomy, and then when the sigma can't woo women, they woo men on incel forums instead. And on this note, we can't forget contempt for the feminine, can we? 
the devaluing and mocking of all things considered traditionally feminine, and by extension, those who embrace and exhibit these traits. Oh, and of course, homophobia and transphobia, a great dislike towards those who don't conform to the traditional heterosexual and cisgender norms, often rooted in the fear of being perceived as less masculine. You know the type. Those who are right now leaving a dislike and calling me woke because I use the word cisgender, all while complaining about everyone else being a snowflake. And in this day and age, all of this toxic baggage will come hand-delivered to you under the banner of reject modernity, embrace cringe. Okay, it's actually embrace masculinity, and the delivery boy will either be an effigy of Ziz or a chad of the Eastern Orthodox Church. Basically, while many traditionally masculine things are very good for society, and especially men, many other traditionally masculine things are not good for society, and especially men. The worst of these traits have been challenged over the last 70 years, and second wave feminism has played a major role in this. But it actually started much further back, and this was a surprise when I started researching the book. You have to go all the way back to the Industrial Revolution. Really, Nancy? Don't you think that most of these toxic traits long outdate the Industrial Revolution? You have to go all the way back to the Industrial Revolution, right. because prior to that, men worked with their husbands, <laughs> men worked with their wives and their children all day on the family farm, the family industry, the family business. And so the cultural expectation on men focused much more on their caretaking role. Right. So you're telling us that before the Industrial Revolution, everything was just peachy in the realm of masculinity. That men were these nurturing, family-oriented figures. Let's not paint the past with such rosy colours, Nancy. Sure, men worked alongside their wives and children, but don't forget the power dynamics, the societal norms, and the good old-fashioned patriarchy that flavoured much of that history. We're talking about times when women had as many rights as the family horse, and children were seen as labourers rather than little Timmy with dreams of becoming an artist. And so the cultural expectation on men focused much more on their caretaking role. And as for this caretaking role, let's not confuse proximity with actual nurturing and emotional availability. We're talking about an era when father knows best often meant fathers decide everything with an emotional expression being as common as a solar eclipse. The journey to where we are now in understanding masculinity, toxic or otherwise, is a complex one shaped by many more factors than just who was working next to whom on the family farm. In fact, here's a historical fact Back, that was very surprising. Most of the books and literature written on parenting back then addressed fathers. If you go in a typical bookstore today, they're mostly addressed to mothers. And why was that, Nancy? Could it have something to do with the fact that before Christianity went all woke, we insisted that women didn't need to read, and thus pretty much all books targeted men? After all, the patriarchal structure of the family meant that it was ultimately the father's role to ensure that the rearing of the children was done as deemed fit for society at the time. He was responsible for making sure that the women did their job. Genesis 3.16, for instance, has God no less, insisting that women shall serve men. 1 Corinthians 11.3 tells us that the head of every woman is the man. Before the widespread push for gender equality in education, which came largely with second-wave feminism, cultures such as ours prioritised education only for boys so that they could eventually participate in society, business or the clergy, while girls' education was often limited to domestic skills and, in some very rare cases, basic literacy. And I love it when even secular historians bring out the Christian perspective that was very strong in the colonial era. So one historian says, Masculine virtue was defined as duty to God and man. So that sense of duty, where did we lose that? Well, it really started with the Industrial Revolution because it took work out of the home. And of course, men had to follow their work out of the home. And for the first time, you know, they're working in factories and offices. They're not working with people they love and have a moral bond with, with their, with their families. And that's when you see the literature start to change people started to protest. They didn't like what they were seeing. They began to protest that men were becoming uh, individualistic, egocentric, uh, self-interested, greedy and acquisitive. I'm using the language of the day. All right, let's take each claim at a time. First, did the Industrial Revolution take work out of the home? Yeah, it did. 
Before the Industrial Revolution, families worked together in agrarian or artisanal tasks, often from their homes or nearby. With the rise of factories and urbanization, however, work became centralized in specific locations. This shift meant that men, who predominantly took up factory work, spent less time at home, leading to a more pronounced separation of work and family life. This, among other changes, led to the need for women to be literate, and thus child-rearing books started targeting women, and the idea of mothers as the primary nurturer and educators of children was further ingrained. And going three for three, Nancy is also correct to say that there was a significant protest. Indeed, despite the evangelical love of capitalism that's permeated the last hundred years, at first Christians hated capitalism precisely because it encouraged greed, materialism, and self-interest, detracting from community values and family relationships. And so when it comes to these specific toxic masculine traits, which are now ironically celebrated by today's evangelicals, it is fair to say that the Industrial Revolution is a vital seed in this shift. But what about all those other toxic traits? Emotional suppression, hyperaggression, dominance, hypercompetitiveness, recklessness, the treating of women as second-class citizens, contempt for the feminine, and homophobia and transphobia. Tell us, Nancy. Were these toxic traits also a product of the Industrial Revolution? Or are you going to fail to mention them because, under the evangelical view of masculinity, these destructive traits are to be praised? Many people said men are starting to make their idol, you know, their career success, their financial achievements. So the, this was the first time negative language was applied to the male character. And why was it the first time, at least in a long time, that negative language was applied to men, Nancy? It's because it deviated from the dominant Christian view, right? And why is it that we didn't simultaneously see negative language applied to men's emotional suppression, dominance, recklessness, and disdain for women? That's right, it's because these traits didn't meet their challenge until second wave feminism in the 1960s. Nancy is bellowing from a secular podium to a flock that would see her silent, per the words of St. Paul. But what's interesting to me is how it's anybody who has a biblical worldview understands this is perfectly unbiblical. Has Eric actually read the Bible? Numbers 31 not only demonizes a group, but has God command Moses and his army to kill little boys. To demonize men, to demonize women, to suggest that they are intrinsically flawed is a satanic project. Again, has Eric actually read the Bible? Jeremiah, to give just one example, tells us that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And we're seeing it happen, obviously we're seeing it happen with men, but we're seeing the same thing happen with really the erasure of women, and ultimately it's an attack on God and God's view of men and women. Well, exactly. No, not exactly, Nancy. First off, with the exception of a few people on Twitter, nobody's demonizing men here. The critique is calling out certain behaviors and cultural norms that are harmful, not just to men, but to society as a whole. It's not about saying that men are bad, it's about saying that certain behaviors associated with traditional masculinity can be harmful. This is precisely what Nancy is doing, no less, when she critiques capitalism and industry. She's not necessarily saying that men are inherently bad, is she? She's saying that deterministic factors have a negative impact on men. Now, as to whether we agree with her is beyond the point. The point is that just as she isn't, in her critique of capitalism and the Industrial Revolution, making out that men are inherently corrupt, the same is true of those who attack other toxic masculine traits, such as the inability to show emotion. It's exactly like racism. No, it isn't, Eric. Nancy is criticizing cultural expectations of men, not men themselves. Likewise, I am criticizing cultural expectations of men, not men themselves. Racism, however, is insisting that certain races are inherently one way or another. But we're seeing the same thing happen with really the erasure of women. Now, as for the erasure of women, oh boy, that's a bit rich coming from the same crowd that's kept women out of the pulpit and insisting that they stick to traditional roles for millennia. 1 Timothy 2 tells us not to suffer a woman trying to teach us, let alone usurp authority over a man. They must 
be silent. The history of Christianity is, like so many other cultures, a history of erasing women from public life. And ultimately it's an attack on God and God's view of men and women. Let's be clear. Questioning and challenging harmful societal norms isn't an attack on God. It's an attempt to understand and improve the human condition. It's about making the world a more compassionate, understanding place. Something that I'd argue is in line with the teachings of a certain carpenter from Nazareth. So, while Eric and Nancy are busy lamenting the supposed satanic project against masculinity and femininity, don't let them fool you. The critique of masculinity that has produced much of the empathetic world that we so enjoy today was, and is, directed at cultural norms, not at men themselves. The only ones claiming that men, and indeed women, are inherently flawed are those insisting that our ancestors ate a certain fruit from a certain garden. To demonize men, to demonize women, to suggest that they are intrinsically flawed is the Bible, Eric. It's the Bible. 